Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on the Maximum Mom podcast today. I am so excited today to bring you Francis Schefter, who is a lawyer and special education lawyer, kind of a guru in that area. And I'm super excited to talk to her about her experiences. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I've been listening to your podcast for so long and I'm like, Oh, I need to go on that show, I think. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, yeah, you're perfect for this podcast. I'm so excited we're going to have this conversation. Well, first, I always like to start out, I mean, just tell us a little bit about you and tell us, you know, who makes up your family? Who do you love at home and who do you do all this work for? So, I mean, my career started actually as a teacher. So I have uh, an undergrad in early childhood, a master's in special ed. After seven years in the classroom, I was a uh, um, special ed coordinator for two years and I realized I wasn't making the difference anymore. And I had always wanted to be a mom and that's why I went into teaching because I figured I could have the career and mom life also. Um, still wasn't a mom, was still a teacher. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go to law school and see what happens. And uh, I went, went to law school, um, met my husband after. Shortly after we got married, um, we started fertility treatment. And that was just as I started my law firm. Wow. And so like literally getting pregnant and starting a law firm, we're like starting together um, and starting a life as a, as a wife and, you know, in a combined household. Um, so I have two children now, two daughters, both are fertility babies, uh, Hannah, who's seven, and Esther is four. And we have two dogs because you can't neglect the dogs. Um, yeah. Roxy is almost 10 and Reese is three. Oh, uh, what kind? Uh, Roxy is a German Shepherd standard poodle mix. Interesting. She looks like a miniature Irish wolfhound. Oh. Um, which she's 70 pounds. So calling a 70 pound, pound dog miniature, it's kind of right. a little weird, but as an Irish wolfhound, she'd be right. small. And then Reese is a Boykin Spaniel, we think. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So how fun. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, you're going to have to walk me through starting a law firm, starting a marriage and starting a family. You want to talk about the trifecta. You lived it. Yeah. Oh, and, and the fact that I had just moved from Florida back to Maryland um, about a year before. Yeah. It was, um, you know, when I met my husband, I was doing document review in the DC area. Um, and then I started, I became, I got on the panel with DC Superior Court and the abuse and neglect system as a special wow. attorney. And I was doing both. And then after my husband and I got married and we started the fertility treatment, it was just too much trying to do it all. And right. my husband being the amazing supportive husband he is said, you know what? Stop the doc review. We can do this on my salary and we'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. And wow. yeah, that, you know, that was it going through. And, um, you know, it was funny because after my daughter was born, this is obviously before all of this zoom stuff. Right. I remember I had a resolution meeting, um, uh, with Palm Beach, uh, with, uh, PG County public schools. And it was on, it was on the phone and I think it was because I was technically on maternity leave and I was literally on the meeting. Thankfully there was no zoom because I was, my daughter was on, was nursing at the time, wow. you know, as a mom, we got to do what you got to do. Right. And, you know, oh, the case has to go forward. So true. I mean, I would love to like do something to kind of get out in the visual arts. I would love to do like a visual art series of moms working and the things we have all done. I mean, I can, I mean, I know the things I have done and I'm just one tiny speck, you know, in the world of what this has looked like. And just the vision of you nursing, going to a meeting like this. I mean, this is what we do all the time. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Cause we have to, you know, what else are we going to do? Right. <laughs> the juggle is real. I mean, it is, and I think that I just feel like as women, I mean, this is one reason this podcast started. I mean, we, I think, don't spend enough time acknowledging what we really do and what we really juggle and really patting ourselves on the back and being like, I mean, we are kind of badass creatures when it comes to our abilities to do this. And I think a lot of us suffer from 
I mean, what I call like my mean girl in my head, I've, you know, lovingly named her Eloise. But I mean, she talks smack a lot about what I don't do right. And I mean, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, what your juggle has looked like and how you have handled if you have maybe a mean girl in your head too, or somebody called it the other day. It was, I forget what it was. It was like the nasty sister or something. (laughs) I mean, do you suffer from any of that as well? I do. I mean, I definitely come across, you know, the times that I feel like I'm a failure at everything right? because trying to be a mom, trying to be a lawyer, trying to run a law firm, trying to be a wife. Like I just, you know, can't, like, I feel like I'm not doing anything right. And then I had a nanny. I was working in the home with my daughter um, and had a nanny with her, obviously, because as the law firm grew um, and when she was 18 months, she was behind in her speech. And that, I mean, okay, former special ed teacher, special education attorney, wait, what? My daughter, like, I I mean, the guilt was like, if I had stayed home with her, would she have not? And so forth, Um, got her obviously qualified in services and immediately put her into preschool because I knew the language development, that's what she needed. But the mom guilt from that was just so unbelievable because of my background and everything. Like, you know, you fail as a parent, you feel like a failure as a parent, even though it had nothing to do with that. Right. Isn't that fascinating though? And just the thought too, when you realize she was behind what you knew to do and the amount of expertise you had in your brain and ability to get her services. I mean, when I hear that story, I think of all the parents out there that have no idea what to do. And does your work address that? Like, how do you help parents know what needs to be done? What does the research show, you know? It I, totally does. And that's one of the reasons I started a YouTube channel um, that I do little three minute videos on mm-hmm. all these little things, because a lot of times schools or family, well-meaning family members, or even doctors will say, oh, wait and see, they'll develop, wait, you know, just wait another month, they'll catch up, which is the absolute worst advice ever, because right. it's all studies have shown the sooner you get services for your child, the better they'll do. Mm-hmm. Um, like if you look at language and when we learn language, that's when we're, spo- you know, children are sponges and they learn everything. Right. Um, you know, with my daughter, because I knew what to do, I got her qualified. I got her through infants and toddlers getting services. We also did private services through our insurance mm-hmm. and did all of that. She now, she has a little bit of articulation, but her expressive language is off the charts. Right because we got the services so early and we knew that. And right. that's, you know, I do the YouTube channel to, and I try to get it out to as many parents as possible because it's all federal of like, this is why you need to do, and this is what you need to do. Like we all that joke is, about our mom instinct. Yeah. <laughs> and it's real. We know it even is. dad, you know, like our parent instinct, it's, it's, it's true. It's real. We know. Well, just knowing though about your YouTube channel makes me, it just gives me thoughts about sharing that resource with families, you know, even families who are going through divorce, a lot of times these issues will be part of the mix. And sometimes, you know, it might be the catalyst to why they're divorcing because they truly can't agree on um, accepting maybe the diagnosis or accepting what they might be dealing with. And I find often you'll have one parent that's all gung-ho, like let's get services, let's address this. And another parent's like, oh, my child doesn't have this or that can't be right. Or kind of like you said, oh, we'll just wait and see what happens. And I think hearing from somebody like you in your position could be really helpful to those families because I mean, the research is pretty clear on early intervention. Definitely. And I've seen that a lot with divorcing parents that they Mm -hmm. don't agree. Um, And it's a challenge. And I've, I've told, you know, I have friends that are family law attorneys also, and I tell them, whatever you do, make sure you have one of the parents be the final education decision maker. Both can be equal. But what happens is if you have two parents that have differing you know, the school's stuck with two parents, you know, one saying special ed, the other saying not. And what do you do? Whereas yeah. you need the court intervention, unfortunately, and it's easier to do it on the front end than the back end. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such an interesting point. I mean, and it's a real, 
it's a real struggle for sure. I mean, I also wanted to bring up, I mean, so like, I don't have your special education knowledge, obviously at all, but know enough to understand, you know, what's available and, you know, kind of what the schools need to do. And when I had my own situation with my own child, who I think at the time was probably 17, he was a junior in high school. I mean, long story, big accident, you know, major stuff going down. And he was on an IEP. And so when I was trying to get the school to to talk to me and him about, you know, what this could look like. Cause once he had this big accident, there was all these medical appointments that came into play as well, you know, getting all this physical therapy and all this stuff. And the school literally was like, well, you know, we can talk to you they, in seven months. I mean, that was when they tried to give me an appointment. And I was like, <laughs> excuse me. I'm like, that's not exactly the time frame that the law provides for this. Exactly. <laughs> And they do that, right. It was stunning. (laughs) Yeah. And they do that all the time. I mean, I had it with my daughter when she went from pre, when she was still in preschool, she was getting services at one school and they didn't know what I did for a living. And they they started giving me pushback and I'm going, well, the research-based interventions we've done are da 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 And they're looking at me and I'm like, oh, let me introduce myself and tell you what I do. Right. And then it was the whole meeting changed, which is sad because, it, it is. you know, like you shouldn't have to have a law degree to get your child what you need, what your child needs. No, the school should be, should be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Some are great at it. Mm-hmm. The teachers usually want to do it, but their hands are tied, which is why I left teaching because right. I couldn't make it about the kids anymore. Well, and I think that is the biggest struggle when it comes to getting services is navigating that reality of, I mean, some schools are amazing and they kind of fall over themselves to do it, do it well, be helpful, offer resources, communicate well. And other schools, I'm like, did you all learn the same stuff that other people learned? Like, I mean, it's, And it's so unfortunate for the children who get stuck in this process. And I just feel so strongly for parents because, I mean, having been a parent of several children who have needed different things through the years, I realized that my law degree and my ability to advocate comes into play so hugely in that process. And I just feel like it's a, it's an unfair system often from the get-go. Agreed. And I, I say all the time that it's the principal that makes a difference in the school, oh. how the principal feels about special education. Mm-hmm. You can see the difference Interesting. Uh, in meetings. Like I can see where the teachers, I have emails sent to my, to my clients about what the teachers say. And then we sit at the meeting and the teachers are, are zipped and won't say anything. And it's like, you can tell because they're afraid of what the principal might do, Um, which is, it can be scary. It can be hard. You know, I remember as a first year teacher, you don't want to do something wrong. You're not going to be brought back the next year. But I mean, what a powerful, I mean, influence I think teachers have on that whole idea of kind of creating a world of happiness and acceptance for children in the classroom. I mean, like teachers are such powerful forces in that. And if their hands get tied, I mean, it is, I mean, the children are the only ones that are really going to be suffering through that. And the teachers get burnt out because it's hard. I mean, I've seen it so many times with the teachers, they want, I mean, you don't go into teaching for the money. We all know that, you know, you go in because you love children and you want to make a difference. And, you know, you have X amount of kids in your classroom and how many different IEPs and no extra help. And you're trying to do everything you're trying to do. Um, And you have administration telling you, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, you know, the central office saying you can't do this, you can't do that. And you just want to teach and like, just leave me alone and let me teach my children. Right. Um, And a lot of times they can't. (laughs) I mean, I am curious from somebody with your expertise and knowledge. I mean, how do you think the Zoom school impacted special ed in particular, you know, during COVID? I can, I really can't even imagine. 
Um, I was, it was a mess for the majority uh, mm -hmm. because uh, for your children with ADHD, they're not going to sit, in, you know, at a screen. Right. Those of us without ADHD are not going to sit at a screen for six hours, you know, right. um, you're all of like all of the children. It was so hard. And then, you know, I'm, I was lucky. I had, I was able to hire a sitter, a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. who was actually a teaching major that sat with my daughter to make sure everything was going on. Most families couldn't afford that and couldn't do that. Right. So they're trying to work and trying to get their children in. Um, it, it, it was definitely challenging. They, a lot of kids missed out on services. A lot of schools didn't provide services, kind of said, oh, because of COVID, we can't. Right. And the parents didn't know that they can't That's say not. that. Right. <laughs> it's not exactly the, the federal government said flat out, like, no, IEPs must be implemented. Timelines must stay the same. You cannot, you know, you cannot use this as an excuse. You need to figure out how to do it. Wow. Yeah, that alone. I mean, just having that knowledge in place of what what is following the law and what is not following the law. Um, yeah. I mean, that can make all the difference. Wow. And, what an and interesting. Now the, the, and the federal government also said that when we come back, so the beginning, when we came back to school this year, mm -hmm. all IEP teams are supposed to meet and discuss whether there was a regression or lack of mm -hmm. progress towards IEP goals, and then develop a plan of how to bring the child back up to where the child should be. Wow. I, but they're I, not doing it. I was going to say, I, I can't even imagine that can be happening. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I really, I mean, when you really sit and think about the, the volume of people who are on the IEPs, I mean, what are the stats on that? Like what, I mean, what is typical, I guess, you know, how many kids are on IOP, IEPs or 504 plans? Um, I, you know, it depends on the area. Okay. And it depends. I, Unfortunately, it depends on economic factors mm -hmm. because a lot of times when children don't have the language rich environments mm -hmm. and so forth, they're thought to be behind. Right. You know, the other thing that's happening, like when I was in school, kindergarten was optional. Right. You know, and now they're expected to read in kindergarten. Right. It's so not developmentally appropriate. So all right. of a sudden in first grade, if you're not reading, you're considered special ed when it's just not like right. give the children a you know, there, there's a, it's almost like when we were in law school, remember the aha moment we all had that we finally got it and understood yeah. what we we're supposed to do. It's the same thing with reading with children. They'll be behind, behind, behind. And then all of a sudden something will click. Right. And boom, they skyrocket. Well, and that could happen, you know, like. <laughs> It does though. I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head so much about the developmental piece of what is appropriate and what is not. I mean, and I think this to be true kind of across the board where parents in general and society expects children to be like many adults in their development. And that's just not what is real in their brain. And um, I mean, I don't know. I was definitely not that parent who was like, oh my gosh, we got to learn to read. I mean, we definitely had a language rich home where, I mean, they were being read to. We listened to books on tape like crazy. You know, they were being exposed to language and my kids all learned to read at different ages. I mean, some as late as like third grade, they were really not into reading until third grade. But I mean, they're doing fine. You know what I mean? Like it's, I don't know. I think children develop very differently. And especially if you have a child with some attention issues, I mean, learning to read can be such a chore attention wise. And with everything else that's going on, you're learning right. to read and then write and math and behave and sit at a table and socialize and all of this right. stuff. And it's so frustrating because there's so much emphasis putting on reading, writing and math, which there needs to be. But there's the arts, there's the science, there's the social studies and kids are being brought up that if they feel, I've seen it so many times, if they can't read, they feel stupid. Right. But they might be an amazing, you know, with geometry or putting totally. things together or engineering skills that the average person can't. So it's like, 
we need to start looking at where Absolutely. the children excel and focus on that and remind them like you are awesome you can do this it's okay if that's a weakness you know it's i find that so much even in our adult world i i talk about all the time like there's so much stuff i suck at i truly just suck at a lot of things and i, I can't do them i shouldn't do them like they're just not in my wheelhouse. And instead of spending all my energy trying to fix those, I kind of just decided to embrace them and just figure out what they are and get somebody else to do them who's better at it than I am. I mean, the whole idea that we're supposed to spend all this energy fixing the stuff we can't do rather than actually working to our strengths and really capitalizing on what we're amazing at makes very little sense to me. Agreed. It's so, it's so challenging. And it's, it's almost like, well, you're supposed, you know, you're an adult, you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. Well, right. you know what? I don't want to, I'm going to do this to earn the money so I can pay somebody else to do that exactly. because I don't want to do that. And I don't like to do that, you know, well, or I suck at that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, there's a lot out there that I'm like, mm, not my strong suit. So I'm not, Agreed. I mean, I really learned to embrace the stuff that I'm not great at and just work around it and rather than spend all my energy focused on it. I mean, one, it gives Eloise so much to talk about if I spend yeah. all my energy focused on what I'm bad at, you know, and I don't need to feed her, fuel all her sassing. And so I like to focus on what I'm good at. And then that helps me keep that mean girl quiet. And it allows me to be more in a flow where I'm doing what I'm good at. And I think I have a son who my youngest, who is literally like an amazing engineer type. I mean, the kid rebuilds cars. He can build anything. He is just an absolute genius at engineering, you know, anything mechanical. He can do it. If I tell him he's got to sit down and read, you know, a thousand page novel, I mean, he truly would rather poke his eyeballs out. Um, but I mean, do I think for a minute that's going to stop him from being able to be, you know, self-sufficient, a good citizen, a good human, whatever? No, I mean, he just gets his knowledge in different ways than, you know, somebody who might be an English major type. Right. And that's the whole point. I mean, like, that's also the point of an IEP is like to help give exactly. the support to build on the weaknesses to get you where you need to be to at least to be able to function. Unfortunately, yep. again, it's still focused on the reading, the writing, the math, and not on the, the life skills that you might need as an adult that you aren't getting elsewhere. Right. And, and, the, and that it's okay. Like, it's okay if you don't know how to cook. You know what? So what? Hire a chef or, you know, whatever, you know, you can't read a recipe or follow a recipe because measurements don't work for you. Okay. So that's not your strong suit or, you know, whatever it is that it's okay to ask for help, but it's okay to have support. You don't have to do everything and be good at right. everything. Yeah, you really don't. And I think that's one thing as moms is one of our big struggles is that feeling of we have to be able to do it all. Like we need to be the, you know, Martha Stewart at home, the, you know, we're going to be a, a great business leader and businesswoman. And, you know, we also need to be, you know, these wonderful wives, supportive. I mean, it's like, it's a lot, you know, <laughs> and to put it all together into one person. I mean, it can feel exhausting. It, and it's expected of us. It is so hard because it's like, you know, as I said, the mom guilt, you know, like we're, right. we're, we're mom, we're supposed to do all this and, and, you know, but I want to be a lawyer and I'm really good at it. And I'm really good at helping families. And I wanted to right. be able to do that and teach them. And how do you find, you know, they say the balance, there's never going to be a balance. You never. just have to, with every day, look at what is your priority? And it's actually been a mind shift for me recently of that my children are my priority. And I need to, to remember, you know, if a school, you know, a client needs me, oh, well, we have a meeting coming up and like, sorry, if I have something for my child, that's going to take priority. And I, you know, and that's okay. It is. Yeah. I think you make such a great point to really think about what is your priority and then kind of live that out in your, on your calendar. 
and, um, and make sure, I mean, I know for me, I mean, my children are older now, so it's a little bit, you know, of a different situation, but when they were younger, I mean, I would spend Sundays and, you know, I had four biological children and still do, and then two stepdaughters, but really on my calendar, I would put in things for my four children that were important for that week, whether it was going to a football game, going to a swim meet, you know, attending some parent teacher conference, or maybe just like spending time with a child, you know, maybe I was going to get a manicure or something with my daughter, but really putting those things on my calendar before the rest of the stuff went on my calendar. And that allowed me to prioritize the stuff that was important to me, because for me, it was, you know, being present as a mom. I mean, I, I agree with you. There really is never going to be a balance. I mean, there's always a shuffle you're doing, but figuring out what is your priority, and then you can actually put it there first, and then everything else can fall in place around that. That's so true. And it's also, you know, I remember looking back and like my dad making a comment one time when we were kids, he felt like he wasn't around that much because he, he was an entrepreneur as well. But it was the, the time we spent with him was quality time. And that's the difference. Cause I was like, I mean, yeah, I remembered it, that he was late to a lot of things, but we always had dinner together as a family, mm -hmm. you know, cause that was important. And we always did Sundays together with my grandfather usually and things mm -hmm. like that. And that like, it brings me back to remember, like I talked to my girls, like, sorry, mommy's away this weekend. It's a retreat weekend. I have a lot of work, but I promise next weekend, we're going to do something fun and talk through that. to so make sure they know like, you can do the balance. Yep. Um, there was a recent movie, I, I, you probably haven't seen it, it's called Wish Dragon. And oh. it, the whole premise is there's the, the single mom with a son and the single dad with a daughter. And they grew up in the, they, they, their for beginning of life was together in like a small little, you know, um, one bedroom apartments, not very affluent. And the father just wanted all the wealth and wanted the daughter to have the best, but was mm -hmm. never around. And the mother who had nothing was always there and involved in the son's life. And he knew she, he was loved and at every birthday and stuff. And it was the two and showing the two. And I loved it because like what I said to my daughters were you can have both, right. you know, mommy's gonna, gonna do all this stuff and is gonna run her law firm and is gonna make the money to give us the better life and so forth. And, you know, daddy with his work too, but we're also going to have this family time that we're going to be at your birthday all the time. We would never miss an important event like that. And that, wow. that it's okay. It is. And it's so cool to normalize that mommy is going to do all this. I mean, I don't know if you, have you read, there's a book called Fair Play by Eve Rodsky. Have you read that? I have not yet, but it's, it is one on my list. Oh, it is. It is interesting. It sounds like your husband, though, is wildly supportive and already very helpful in doing things, um, which I, I think is, you know, more on the rare side of things. Um, but it is something that I think if we can have more constructive conversations, too, in our homes, you know, with our partners about how do we look at, you know, the overall deck of cards that is our lives, you know, and all the, the chores or tasks, if you will. And in Eve's book and in the card deck, there's a hundred cards. And when you really go through those a hundred cards, boy, is it fascinating to see like either what's important to you, what's important to your spouse, and then what's not important to both of you. And that is probably for me was one of the most telling things is how many cards we could just throw out and be like, we don't care about this. So we're not going to spend our time and energy focused on it because there's so much stuff out there that I think we do because we quote unquote, think we should do it. Society expects it. Yeah. Rather than us being real intentional about what are we spending our time on and what what are our values, and that was a really eye opening conversation. And for me, the fair play cards and book just allow for so much robust, frank communication that is just so helpful to building a strong marriage. You know, in making sure you're addressing the things that a lot of people end up with so much pent up anger. I mean, rage, in fact over 
I've seen that. And, and, and that people, you know, once you bring children in, everything's all so focused on the ch children, yeah. you forget about the marriage. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, the kids grow up and they're out of the house and you're like, who is this person? You yeah. know, that's sleeping next to me every night. Like you don't even yeah. know each other anymore. It's that's really yeah. scary. Yeah. Yeah. I've been really, I mean, I've been really moved by the fair play in the system and how it can bring just better communication to the whole process. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because one thing that I feel just in talking with you and just the whole time I've been with you, you have a sense of, I don't know what the right word is, but almost like calm, kind of peaceful fulfillment almost about what you're doing and how you do it. Like you, you seem to approach this whole idea of balance in a way that feels more calm and content. I mean, how do you describe like fulfillment? Like, I mean, what what does it look like for you to, to kind of live a fulfilled life? I mean, for me, it was finding, finding my true passion mm -hmm. and what I love. And, you know, like, as I said, like all I wanted to do as a child was be a mommy. I've always, I was always good with kids. I mean, since I was a kid myself, like babies always came to me, I would, they'd fall asleep in my arms and moms would say, they don't go to anyone, you know, things like that. And I always wanted children. And so I always knew I needed to make that difference. Um, and it's just that I realized, yes, I work, but I love what I do. I'm so passionate about what I do. I love helping families. I love getting services in place for these children. I love educating people. Um, and I love showing my children, my girls, that you can have it all. Because that's like growing up, I didn't think I could have it all. I thought I could be a mom or I could be a career woman. It wasn't that you could do both. And now I was able to find my own way of, yes, I can be a great mom. I can be a career person. And then in opening my own law firm, I have that flexibility of I can make it work, you know, and yes, it's a lot of work, you know, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's not for the, the faint of heart, you know, <laughs> like oh, it's a lot all. of work, uh, you know, lots of hours of putting the kids to bed and, you know, midnight till 3 a.m. doing what I got to do to get it done. But yeah. it's worth it because I love what I do. It, it, it feeds my soul knowing right. that I've been able to help others. And that's what gives me peace. I love that. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, I felt that way big time. We're doing a lot of work as a guardian ad litem just and working some crazy hours around my own kids and their activities. But I never, I, I never begrudged that. I always was just appreciative that I was able to run my own law firm and have that flexibility like you talk about. I mean, it's that flexibility is critical, I think, to being able to create the life that, I mean, and I call it life work integration. I mean, I've given up on work-life balance. Like, I just think that's <laughs> for the birds. But um, I mean, life work integration requires flexibility. And um, I think without it, it's impossible. And I mean, we could have a whole conversation. I think more law firm owners have got to wake up and smell the coffee that their law firms are not going to succeed if they do not provide that type of flexibility for their their team members. I mean, because it's, it. let's face it, it's, we all work to provide for our families, you know? I mean, right. and if we don't figure that out and figure out how to work around it, I just don't see how law firms will continue to succeed. I think their model of everyone come to the office, you know, 8.30 to five and, you know, you First figure out in, the rest. last one out. I mean- it's just, it's absurd. And it's just not, it's not what's happening in today's world. And it's impossible as a parent. I mean, cause kids schedules don't, they don't drive with that at all. Right. And that's, I mean, I think with COVID, a lot of law firms are starting to open their eyes and see that it's not as important. And the reality is if you don't trust your team members to be working from home, you don't trust them in the office either. What difference does it make? You know exactly. what I mean? Like, it's exactly. not a good team member. Like, find one that wants to be there exactly. and treat them. And, you know, it's my dad was always, that was one of his big things is treat your employees well so yeah. that they're loyal to you and believe in your business and then your business will grow. 
and you'll do well. And it's so true. And he was so before his time with all of this that, you know, Love like, that. yeah, it's, you know, he always treated them well. He did an annual party for them. You know, he has employees that, you know, he sold the business in, I want to say 92. And I mean, employees that still kept in touch with him. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's so, so true. And I mean, for me, I know providing that flexibility is just, it's such an important aspect of what we do. And I mean, and it's one of these things that's really fundamental. I I look at being a family law firm owner. I mean, obviously we deal with divorce all day long and custody issues and problems. And then I'm going to look at my own team member and not provide flexibility and leave and, you know, the things that they need so that they can be excellent parents and excellent spouses. I mean, there's a hypocrisy in that, that I cannot get past. And, so um, you know, it's something that I just, oh yeah, I feel really strongly about it. And I think moms are some of the greatest team members, you know, because they, they can figure it out and they do know how to get in some work in between, you know, nursing a baby and the end of that nap time or whatever. And they, they can do things that a lot of other people really can't pull off. I mean, I marvel all the time at our team and what they're able to accomplish. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, being a mom also it's I love the word integration, but it's like finding of what matters and what you need to do and yeah. what can wait a minute you yeah. know and it's okay like that's and it's also being at peace with yourself because that's the the you know i have to give 100% to this and to this and to this and well there's not that many you know you only have 100% and you have to find what matters and make that you know that integration work and we we get it done yep. you know like oh, it's big time my husband <laughs> i had a very long labor with my first daughter and my oh. husband <laughs> I had to take my phone away because I was sending emails. I'm like, I'm a law firm owner. I don't have an assistant. It's got to get done. <laughs> you know, like, like honey, I'm like, being efficient right now. Right? Come like, on. What are you talking about? It's okay. <laughs> I'm stuck in this bed. I can do some emails. Exactly. You're in labor. And I'm like, you do what you got to do. Right. And I mean, really, are the emails going to impact the labor? Probably not, you know? Right. And, and it's just one more thing I can check off and not have to worry about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is a fascinating, I mean, women are fascinating to me in what we manage to pull off. And I just, I mean, I love meeting somebody like you because you do have this sense of real peace about it that I think a lot of women really yearn to get to. And, um, and so, I mean, I'm really thrilled that you were able to come on and talk to me today because I think a lot of people will feel that same real contentment and peace and that inner peace you have that allows you to just accept that you're doing the best you can. Some things might not look perfect every moment of every day, but that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. I mean, it, you know, you're just on the journey. And I'm human and we all make mistakes and it's acknowledge of when I make a mistake, like, right. you know, when I snap at my daughter, because it was just a long day or something went on. Yeah. And I just say to her, like, I'm so sorry, honey, that wasn't your fault. Mommy was just upset and thinking about something else. And I love you and right. she'll get over it. You know, she'll be okay. Right. But because I take that extra minute to explain to her, it's not about you. It's, you know, right. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we could do a whole podcast Hold on up. that. Oh exactly gosh. a whole other topic uh, yes yeah. indeed well I mean Francis I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me today and for those of you listening I mean please subscribe and you can find us you know anywhere you listen to podcasts and subscribe and I can't wait to come see you all again next week and I appreciate it Francis and I hope you have a great rest of your day thank you I thank you. you okay Bye. Bye.